Welcome to Chautauqua. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> uh, just, Seth, you, you have argued so many times before the uh, United States Supreme Court and uh, tremendous reputation. One of the new articles that came out in the ABA Journal, and I read it just yesterday, is New Theories of Evolution. I don't know if you, you saw this. I did get my new copy of the ABA Journal, but I'm nowhere near having read it, so I didn't. Good. Uh, it says, when the United States Supreme Court lawyers, of which you are, and scholars gather, they occasionally challenge each other to s a sort of parlor game to see if they can name the justices who grew more liberal or more conservative. Picking the first group is usually a no-brainer. Conservatives have railed for years against left-leaning legacies of Republican appointees, Blackman, Souter, Stevens, and Warren, among other names. But trying to identify conservative converts gives pause. Is this a parlor game among your colleagues where you kind of, as you're anticipating an argument, guessing their sensibilities? And well, I mean, I think there, there are two issues here. One, I think the parlor game you're referring to is sort of people who study the Supreme Court as an institution rather than looking at arguing a particular case and observing the phenomenon that you articulated that one expects justices to evolve in their jurisprudence because we're all human beings and we all evolve our views as we move along in life. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we become wiser. Um, there is a, at least a popular notion that Justices tend to evolve in a more, quote, liberal direction than conservative direction. Um, I don't think that there is any scientific data to back that up. And one of the things that would sort of confound a scientific study is trying to figure out what liberal versus conservative is. We can all identify particular social issues or some doctrines of jurisprudence that seem more liberal than conservative. But applying those labels across the Supreme Court's jurisprudence is hard. And I also think that, I mean, if one were thinking popularly of instances where justices tended to be, I don't know what you would call it, more hardline, more conservative in their views, you could certainly think of some. I think Justice Scalia in many respects has become more hardline and doctrinaire in a conservative direction than when he first joined the court. Certainly in federalism cases, that's true. Uh, I think Justice White, in a number of respects, became um, less liberal mm -hmm. over the course of his tenure on the Supreme Court. Now, that's different than being an advocate in a particular case and trying to figure out how to convince five justices, because five is the only number that really matters in the right, Supreme right. Court, how to convince five justices that your position is the wiser one and is the one that's more consistent with the text of the Constitution, the intent of the framers, the congressional intent, things like that. Um, I find it in the con in the context of being an advocate of thinking about who's grown more liberal or who's grown more conservative to be useless. I mean, the, the justices are confronting particular questions that are presented in a way that lawyers and courts frame legal issues. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the broad evolution of a particular justice's ideology is rarely helpful. You do sort of think about what do I need to do to win this case and is it the right thing to do and are those in fact the theories that I think are correct. Curious the procedure as cases evolve their way through the district court and find their way uh, when does a Seth Waxman get engaged in a, uh, a case? At, at the district court level or the fact finding level or do you find yourself involved uh, at the uh, Court of Appeals? The answer to that question is yes. I started out my career as a trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I went to work in the Justice Department in 1994, um, 
I had argued one and only one case in the Supreme Court, probably a half a dozen cases maybe in the courts of appeals. Uh, in the case that I argued in the Supreme Court, I was appointed by the court to argue, and it was a it was a habeas petition from what was ultimate, what had previously been a criminal trial. And so, in in my own career, I essentially was a trial lawyer before I went to work in the Justice Department in 1994. And when I came out of the Justice Department in 2001, I had somehow become transformed either in my mind or most likely in the minds of all potential clients as an appellate lawyer. And so now my practice is, I would say, I spend about half my time, a good half my time, advising clients and litigating cases and thinking about strategy at a stage long before the case gets to the Supreme Court. I'm much more interested in how to help clients think about achieving their goals and how to help the country move policy at the ground level mm -hmm. rather than necessarily parachuting in for appeal or at the Supreme Court. That said, I do have, I do take lots of cases on at the formal appellate level or at the Supreme Court level, but I don't really see myself as an appellate lawyer versus a trial lawyer in the way that um, I think most people do right now. Right. Uh, how much of the policy aspect of when you see a case and say, gee, this is ripe for um, a constitutional consideration as opposed to just something which uh, the client, the longstanding client says, we need to win this case for the good of the corporation or the good of the client? Well. I think there's a difference between a lawyer's pro bono practice and a lawyer's paying client practice. Um, and the notion of doing pro bono work is that members of the legal profession get to choose, and I think have an ethical obligation, a civic obligation to choose to give back to the community to figure out how to apply their talents and their their skills in a way that will make the world a better place mm -hmm. in their own vision. And um, that lawyers ought to choose for themselves how they want to allocate their civic time. In terms of paying clients, my, my own practice has not, has really never been a very typical private litigation practice. I started practicing law firm, uh, w law in a small boutique law firm in Washington, D.C., which is far from the home of virtually any corporation or real person. And it was a small firm that always, formed by a, a bunch of emigres from the Justice Department, it was always a firm that attracted one-of-a-kind, oddball cases, basically the kind of case where a client would could justify paying pretty high hourly rates um, for lawyers who weren't expert in any particular substantive area of the law. And so I just, I was incredibly fortunate in having a practice that involved public policy questions of one sort or another from the outset, even for private uh, and commercial clients. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I've never really had, I mean, what I've always thought of as a typical litigation practice. You know, you become expert in commercial litigation or intellectual property litigation or real property litigation or s domestic litigation. I've had the, the unbelievable opportunity to try and argue all of those cases without ever pretending to clients that I actually know anything about this substantive area, and that's still happening. Um, and so it's uh, basically allowed me to live my entire professional life partly as a student and partly trying to be a teacher. Right. And you know, even the cases that I'm doing, that I'm working on right now, 
um, you know, are half a dozen cases, the substantive area of which I don't, and the technology and, and, and background information I didn't previously know anything about. So if it's an interesting question and it involves a walk of life that I'm not terribly familiar with, it's appealing to me. The perfect Chautauqua in this intellectual <laughs> curiosity. <laughs> well, that's why Chautauqua seems like such a perfect place to me. Uh, you, you destined to be a lawyer? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly when it was that I decided I was going to be a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure that I backed into it without, because I don't think growing up I really appreciated what lawyers did. Um, the possibilities that lawyers have to, to be involved in a professional way in the civic life of their communities and their countries. You know, I grew up in New England. I went to public grade school, you know, junior high school, high school. I uh, went away to college, all the way, 90 miles away to college, and loved the process of learning new things and being exposed to people that were just a lot different than me, yeah. much more so than was the case in high school. and. Um, I didn't really have any idea what I wanted to do. I, I you know, many of my friends were pre-med and I was pretty clear that I couldn't stand the sight of blood <laughs> and the idea of actually making my life uh, in medicine was unappealing. Um, so when I graduated from college, I got a fellowship to, that allowed me to go very far off the beaten path and live in rural Kenya mm -hmm. uh, and gave me an opportunity about what I wanted to do, lots of time to think about what I wanted to do, and I decided I would go to law school because I had been thinking about maybe getting a PhD and becoming a scholar, but it seemed sort of solitary and maybe a little self-indulgent, and so I applied to law school from Kenya um, via aerograms uh, with the idea that it seemed like there would be a lot of interesting things to learn and everybody told me, oh, if you become, if you get a law degree, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really only when I was pretty much through law school, the end of my second year in law school, that I sort of thought, you know, I gotta try this. I gotta really see whether litigation is something that I'd be good at and that I would like, and so I applied for a clerkship with a district judge, mm -hmm. a trial judge, who had a reputation as of somebody who was an enormous intellect and had been at the very top of the sort of the trial bar in the United that States, Gerhard, Gerhard Gazelle. And uh, working with him one-on-one, -on -one, because he only took one law clerk, for a year had a big impression on me. I saw the kind of issues that he had involved himself in his whole life and the amount of impact he had, not only on his client's well-being, but really on the life of the nation by virtue of having been a lawyer. So I decided when my clerkship was ending, okay, I, I gotta try this thing. And I've been trying it ever since. When you read uh, your Wilmer Hale thing, of course, uh, uh, they, they do the bio on you. As you look at this, and they refer to you as um, uh, uh, both star rating by the Chambers USA, and of course, it's it's a variety of wonderful accomplishments you've reached. When you read that, though, do you do you recognize yourself? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I about two or three years ago, I got an email from our business development people. I started getting emails saying that their biography was probably out of date and I really needed to review it and help them update it and I have to admit that I have not had a very active role in that bio. So uh, when I've glanced at it, it, what it looks like is, you know, a list of memberships and accomplishments and awards and things like that. 
that never reflects who a person is. I mean, it, it probably reflects the way a, a law firm, speaking from the business perspective, you know, wants to um, showcase its lawyers with their accomplishments and their awards, but it doesn't really, wh when I look at it, I think, wow, <laughs> how did all those things happen? <laughs> Um, but I don't really feel like it explains who I am. It doesn't really even make an effort to explain who I am as a person and what my aspirations are um, as a lawyer and a human being. What are your aspirations? <sighs> wow. This is, uh, I mean, my professional aspirations are to... Um, what they've always been, which is to to do the absolute very, very, very best job that I can do for any client whose interest I've taken on. Um, and as a member of the legal profession, to use my experiences and my skills in ways that will, as I said, in some incremental way make our country and our community a, a better place. Um, I always, I mean, I, my own philosophy is that when you are representing a client, this is going back to being a lawyer, victory in litigation is getting to the end of a trial, a negotiation, an oral argument, a, and believing before you have a decision that you have done absolutely everything you can to fairly and effectively advocate on behalf of the client and however the court ends up deciding it that's you know that's their job but you know coming out of something with a feeling that you have I mean the sports metaphor would be you've left nothing on the field um, and I have to say that uh, I mean, we're here thinking about Justice Jackson. Um, I have done, particularly since I became Solicitor General, and thereafter have done an enormous amount of thinking about Robert Jackson and who he was for a variety of reasons that we can talk about. But, you know, one thing that always impressed me about Jackson was reading some of his reflections and speeches about the role of the lawyer and uh, he gave in particular one talk about after he had become a justice about what constitutes good oral advocacy and you probably know this to quote very well but I use it all the time about the you know the parable about the three uh, workers who are you know cutting stones for a cathedral and what the response of each of the three of them is. And that's the metaphor that I have in my mind as a lawyer. I want... For the tape, why don't you go through that? Well, uh, I don't have Justice Jackson's words in front of me, but he, what he, he was reflecting on um, oral advocacy and lawyer's advocacy and said that, you know, as now as a Supreme Court justice, you know, as he watched the progression of lawyers coming to argue their cases in front of the Supreme Court, he was reminded of the parable uh, of the stonecutters and, you know, one, a visitor to the outskirts of a, you know, a stonecutting operation said to, came up to one stonecutter and said, you know, what are you doing? And the stonecutter said, um, I'm earning my daily bread. And he went to the second stonecutter and said, you know, what are you doing? Hi. Good morning and said, um, what are you doing? And the second stone cutter said, I'm shaping my stones to, my pieces of stone to fit in the building. And the third one said, lifted up his eyes and said, I'm building a cathedral. And what Justice Jackson said is, it lifts the heart of a judge to have a lawyer appear in front of the court who understands that he is building a cathedral. And 
that's the way I think that, that's my professional ambition to, you can all, you will always fall short, mm -hmm. but to try and build a professional cathedral for every case that you handle. Um, I mean, in terms of broader aspirations, that gets into sort of deep life questions about um, work-life balance and how much of one's professional life to devote to private clients versus pro bono matters and teaching and civic responsibilities, which is always in, in flux and ought to be something that people, particularly people who are in professions that are so jealously demanding of their time, mm -hmm. like the practice of law, should think about. Curious, you, you having argued, how many cases have you think you've argued for the Supreme Court? Well, I believe that it's 50 because um, wow. I've just had all sorts of things published saying that I've argued 50 cases. And in fact, I had an exchange with Bill Souter, who's the clerk of the Supreme Court, because I haven't really kept very good track of this. Um, it's, there was an article published that I had argued my 50th case in front of the Supreme Court, and I got an email from Bill Souter with a, just attaching a list which showed my name and their records and 49 cases. And so I looked at it and I sent Bill an email back saying, well, you've listed me here for a case I've never heard of. So that's not right. But there are also a couple cases that I argued that aren't on this list. So just for your rec reference, they've now decided that I've made 50 arguments in the Supreme Court and so that's what we're gonna that's what I'm relying on. Your first argument, you walk in and there's the nine chairs and you come to the podium for the first time. What's, how's Seth Waxman's heart at that point? Well, I, I mean, my first argument is, is, is a pretty special story. Um, I was appointed by the court to represent a twice, a convicted double murderer who had successfully obtained a writ of habeas corpus from the United States Court of Appeals of the Sixth Circuit. He was a, by all accounts, he was a sort of veteran career drug dealer. Um, but he obtained a writ of habeas corpus from the U.S. Court of Appeals on the ground that his conviction had been obtained with a confession that was both involuntary as a matter of Fifth Amendment due process and uh, and had been obtained in violation of the Miranda rules. And as I said before, I was mostly a trial lawyer. I had done a lot of pro bono work since I first started practicing law representing indigent people on death row just to get their constitutional issues before some court. Um, but I had not done a lot of appeals and I'd never appeared in the Supreme Court. Um, my opponent in the case uh, was the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts. And we didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. We met for the first time, literally, 10 minutes before the oral argument as we were arranging our papers on, at the council table on the opposite sides of the podium. And that was the start of a, a long and warm professional relationship. Um, I had gone, the, the, the case had phenomenally interesting and difficult doctrinal questions. Um, and I had gone a few times to the Supreme Court, you know, to sort of watch and see, you know, how does this thing with the nine justices actually work? Um, I was as prepared as any human being, um, any human being that tends to obsessive over preparation can be. Um, when I stood up, I was the respondent, so I went second. Mm -hmm. When I stood up, I, I think it was easier for me to do that because I'd been listening to John Roberts, who was principal deputy solicitor general and uh, a lawyer for the state of Michigan, arguing. And, you know, they're just human beings like me. You know, they're just lawyers who have thought a lot about the case, are being posed a lot of difficult questions. 
When I stood up, I was a lot less nervous than I thought I was going to be. I knew what I wanted to say in my first couple of sentences. I wasn't entirely clear how it was going to work after that, but I was pretty confident based on having watched oral arguments that the justices would take care of that. And, you know, when I stood at the, when I got to the podium and opened my mouth, I could sort of hear my voice shaking a little bit for about three or four words. And then, you know, I sort of looked at them and I thought, they're all interested in what I have to say. And this is a really important case. And I'm right. Our position is right. And this case should be affirmed. And I don't have a lot of time to try and convey this. And I got three or four sentences out of my mouth and the justices jumped on me. And it was, it was probably the most professionally fulfilling 30 minutes of my whole life. It was a fantastically engaging argument. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a case where the legal press had all basically written this thing off. There's no, the Supreme Court granted this to reverse. There is no way they are going to hold that uh, Miranda claims can be raised in federal habeas. And uh, I ended up winning five to four uh, in an opinion written by then new Justice Souter. Mm -hmm. And the day after Justice Souter, well, the case was argued on election day in 1992, and I had never really been involved in partisan politics in my life. But I remember very well that it was going to be, it just so happened that it was, the case was going to be argued on the first Tuesday in November. Debbie and I were talking about this, that it's not as if there would have been blanket press coverage mm -hmm. of, you know, my first argument in the Supreme Court. But Debbie pointed out that since we were, the country was going to the polls to elect a new president that day, it was extremely unlikely that people anywhere were going to be reading about my first argument. And so um, when the case was decided several months later, um, Bill Clinton had been elected president and Janet Reno had just been confirmed as attorney general. And I had helped uh, Janet Reno get prepared for her confirmation hearings and I was invited to um, a reception that the Department of Justice was having to welcome the new attorney general. And so the day after the decision, is the case comes down, and I won, you know, my one and only Supreme Court case, which was so much fun to prepare for and so much fun to argue, and so, such an improbable win. I'm in the line, waiting in the reception line to meet Janet Reno, and I noticed in front of me, the, the back of the guy standing in front of me looks a lot like Justice Souter. And I'd never met Justice or any of the justices before. Mm -hmm. But we're in a pretty long reception line, and I'm sort of standing there, and he's a very shy, modest man, and I sort of keep edging around to try and see from the side, is this really Justice Souter? And if it is, what am I supposed to say to him? He just wrote this opinion. Yeah. So I eventually worked up my nerve, and I, I you know, cleared my throat, and I said, um, excuse me, Justice Souter. And he turned around and said yes in his sort of deep uh, New Hampshire accent. And I said, well, I'm sure you don't remember me, but my name is Seth Waxman, and I argued a case before the court this term, a Withrow versus Williams, and, uh, you know, I won. And he gave me this sort of sardonic grin and said, um, well, you're wrong on several things. I do remember you. Um, I do remember the case. And that's a case that I won. <laughs> and, you know, I said, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's the judge's, that's the justice's view of a particular case and a lawyer's view of the particular case. I, I said to him, I said, absolutely. You know, I argued the case and you provided the fifth vote and the winning opinion. Yep. And so be it. Um, and so that was sort of the story of my first curious you argued 50 cases and then you're done there's a sort of pause and wondering when and how the decision will come down do you know do you get a heads up saying today our decision the decision may come down 
Uh, how does it work in your world? You mean in terms of when they decide? Yeah. No, no. You I mean the the case is argued, and that's the next thing that happens is you know the Supreme Court will hand down a bunch of decisions on. I mean the the the, the days of the month and the days of the year in which the Supreme Court announces decisions is pretty predictable. Um, but what decisions they'll announce when is not. And there are people who, you know, when it's going to be an opinion day, will go to the Supreme Court to sort of hear the arguments. I've never, ever done that. Um, you know, when, I, when I'm finished briefing and arguing a case, my work is over. And now it's up to them. As Justice Scalia once said to me, um, after he had provided the fifth vote in a case against me, you know, I, he said, you must, you must be very disappointed in me or something like that. And I said, you know, I, I, our position was right. And he said, well, I understand. You know, we could have, our job is either to agree with you or move on to our next mistake. <laughs> and I sort of feel like, you know, that's, that's the way it is. Now, you know, there are some cases, there are some cases where losing hurts particularly. But for the most part, I just feel like my job is to do absolutely the very best I can and not to have, not to represent a client, whether it's in the Supreme Court or any place, in a way that I have professional regrets, that I feel like I really didn't give this case my all, or there were other theories, or there was a better way to write this brief. And once I've done that, or come as close as I feel like I can to do that, it's in somebody else's hands. That's the way the system works, and I, I don't have any problem letting go. Right. You then, uh, in, your, in your career, become Solicitor General. When you were commissioned to be Solicitor General, did you have a sense of what your mission might be? Uh, 97, right? 1997? Yeah, I mean, I, I had been uh, the Deputy Solicitor General the year before. And it was a very interesting time because um, President Clinton's first Solicitor General, Drew Days, had left. And uh, the President wasn't ready to nominate a new Solicitor General. And so a wonderful guy who I had spent the previous two years working with in the Department of Justice was a very well-regarded constitutional law professor at Duke, Walter Dellinger, was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, and he was appointed acting Solicitor General for the year. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to be deputy. And we were quite a pair, because each of us had argued exactly one case in the Supreme Court. Walter had come to the whole position from the perspective of a law professor who'd spent his entire career as a legal scholar and constitutional scholar. I had spent my entire professional career as a trial lawyer, other than having spent two years doing policy work in the Justice Department. And so the two of us were in there seven days a week, often by ourselves, having come to this very specialized position from two very different places, and neither of us being 100% sure yeah, how you do this thing. Right. Um, so by the time I, the President asked me if I would <laughs> be Solicitor General, and I, uh, and I said yes, um, I had a pretty good idea of how the job worked. I'd spent a year as the Principal Deputy and had been very, very involved in the position and had quite a lot of time not only to do the job but also to read about prior Solicitor Generals and the history of the office. And I'd already been asked by the Supreme Court Historical Society to give the Society's annual lecture on the history of the Solicitor General's office. And I, by the time that I was confirmed, I felt like I had a pretty good grasp on what the job was. As you were researching the history of that, obviously that's part of Robert Jackson's world and mm -hmm. maybe a segue at this point of what does a Robert Jackson mean to a Seth Waxman? 
Well, um, a great deal, a very great deal, as it turns out. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here with the, at, for the Robert Jackson Center. When I became Solicitor General, actually when I was preparing for my confirmation hearings, a number of people had either said or written how unusual, uh, what an unusual selection I was. Um, it had been a very long time since someone had been picked to be Solicitor General who was, had not been a you know, a court of appeal, an appellate judge, or the dean of a law school, or something like that, um, but really had been a practicing lawyer, and for that matter, for the most part, a practicing trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so I started going back in history to sort of see just exactly how unusual I was. And really for the prior 50 years, that observation was pretty true. And one of the it's hard to say, but one of the most recent predecessors of mine who had started out as a practicing lawyer and hadn't been the dean of a law school or a law professor or an appellate judge was Robert Jackson. And so I was quite interested to hear about Robert Jackson and his career. And of course, I knew that he had been solicitor general and attorney general and uh, associate Justice and had taken this leave to be the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. Um, so I spent time reading about Justice Jackson's life and I read a number of his speeches and articles that he'd, that he'd written and of course during the course of my tenure as Solicitor General I had had occasion to run across some of Justice Jackson's opinions and then um, after I, right after I left office, um, I decided to devote a fairly concentrated period of time reflecting on it and particularly reflecting on my experience as Solicitor General arguing federalism cases, which was a very big part of my docket and a pretty unsuccessful part of my docket because there were five justices on the Supreme mm -hmm. Court who had a larger view of the role of the states and a smaller view of the role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis each other than I did as Solicitor General. And I spent a lot of time researching the New Deal period because the New Deal, the Justice Department in the New Deal, really beginning with Stanley Reed but and continuing through Justice Jackson's various positions mm -hmm. for in Roosevelt's administrations and then his successor Francis Biddle was about you know the sort of strate strategic thinking and strategic litigation in terms of moving judicial doctrines in a way in which the executive branch favored and you know the classic case of moving the courts commerce clause jurisprudence away from a subst restrictive substantive due process model um, was the New Deal. And I did a, a lot of reading about the New Deal Justice Department and the lawyers who made it up. Jackson was obviously a very big role and reflected on why something quite different had happened uh, during the federalism period and why it was that it wasn't the United States Justice Department that had the initiative in picking cases and bringing cases but rather was on the sort of res passive receiving end of this march of cases. So I spent a lot of time and I actually wrote and published some lectures about um, the solicitor, the Justice Department and the New Deal and that caused me to actually have the opportunity to do a lot of reading and thinking about the professional milieu that Robert Jackson was in and contributed to before he became a justice and even after he became a justice. And, and then, you know, I've also, as I guess most Solicitor Generals have been called upon many, many times to talk about advocacy. And in, I generally don't like to sort of just utter forth pearls of wisdom that are usually platitudes like be prepared or speak clearly or answer the question. What I've done is um, try to give a series of speeches and lectures 
about advocates in our history and what it is that they brought to the table, Daniel Webster being, being one, and Robert Jackson being another, because by all accounts, he was first and foremost a premier advocate, not only as a lawyer representing clients, but as an attorney general representing the executive branch, and really as an associate justice advocating a view of the constitutional balance within the court. Um, and so in that context, too, about thinking what it means to be an advocate and what the responsibilities of a public advocate and a private advocate are, I've actually been quite interested to learn Justice Jackson's perspective from his own, in his own words, which is a great pleasure to do because he's an extremely clear thinking, clear writing, plain spoken man. There's not a lot of, you know, highfalutin professional doctrinal obfuscation in Justice Jackson's writing or, or speaking. He very plainly and very eloquently gets right to the point, and I appreciate that. <laughs> and that's what I try to do. Did he show you that he's on a, a, a web page? That uh, did you do it? Did you were you able to find that website? By the way, where you, you're I picture? tried, but I didn't find it. I'll, I'll give you the the, the address. Uh, I was telling him on the phone that I was scrolling around getting biographical information on him, and there was a. A website which just simply had Seth Waxman photo archives. And <laughs> it's a it's a it's a party uh, that that he was at. Uh, it's a viewing of a movie uh, that Justice Breyer, I guess. That's right. And Based on your description, it was the um, the Phillips Gallery had a had an evening in which was. Oh, okay included uh, Justice Breyer's fav uh, private screening of Justice Breyer's favorite film, which was The Third Man, and Justice Breyer, I think, invited me to come watch this. And, and, and the caption, it re refers to, it's, uh, these are, it's a very, they're complimentary pictures, so it's not anything, but, but uh, as a uh, clear candidate to be if there is ever an opening of the, of the Supreme Court, that Scott, you know, you would be, uh, Seth Waxman would be a, one of the foremost candidates. Is that something that people ask you about? I guess so. Um, in Washington, it's, you know, it's not something that people talk about very much. And, you know, when people, but when people ask me about it or I see it written, you know, my attitude is, if they're writing, if they're naming you as a likely candidate for anything, that's almost certain that you won't be. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was writing about me as a likely, a someday solicitor general, that's for sure. Yeah. And I don't live my professional or personal life with an idea to doing anything or getting anything in particular. I sort of feel like it's not only a way to likely be disappointed, but it's 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 a futile way to spend your life, you know, aiming to try and get something else. You ought to try and live your professional life so that you get an enor as much satisfaction as you can out of it at the time, at the moment. And um, I guess that's about all I can really say about it. Sure. Were you surprised when a, a John Roberts and a, and a, w was nominated, or was he on a very short list in your mind's eye? Oh, I think that John was, everybody always saw him as a very strong candidate. He had been nominated um, during the first Bush administration for a seat on the D.C. Circuit. Mm -hmm. and. Um, got caught up in that, you know, year before presidential election madness that is Washington that sort of takes over the confirmation process. Um, you know, John was a premier advocate, um, very well thought of 
in professional circles in, in Washington and in the country. I had a number of the cases that he argued. In fact, I think the two cases that he were pointed to as evidence that he actually could represent liberal causes were two cases that I had referred to him uh, because I couldn't do one when I was Solicitor General and one right after I had left. Um, I think he was a he was a natural to sort of be on the short list. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any, when he was nominated, I don't think anybody was surprised. Do, do you know his, uh, one of his former bosses at Hogan Hearts and Barrett Prettyman? I do. I'm a very big admirer of Barrett's. I think he's coming tomorrow. Oh, really? Here, so he'll be in the audience. Excellent. Well, that's, it'll be a great pleasure of mine. Barrett's on our board, and he's taken a real keen interest in things Jackson, for obvious reasons, and is just thrilled beyond belief that, that you were a part of this. I'm delighted that Barrett is coming. Yeah. So in case you look at you, you'll catch up, obviously, but in case you see him, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, he and the, I don't know if his wife's coming, but uh, he really make, makes an effort to be part of this. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, he's a great, great lawyer a, and a great human being yeah. and he and John were a awesome mm -hmm. awesome professional partnership he enjoys bringing out of the face page of one of their oral arguments and he's at the top and Roberts is at the bottom of six names <laughs> he says it's flipped all of a sudden <laughs> yeah well, Barrett has had a, an outsized influence on the Washington legal community. Is that right? Yeah. In what sense? He's he's very public minded, he's very civic minded. He sort of epitomizes the what I think of as the sort of idealization of the Washington lawyer in the best sense of the word, mm -hmm. somebody who's gripped by the public policy public policy issues and the positive role that lawyers can play if they devote their time to civic debate and improvement of the institutions of justice, leaving incep a, entirely apart um, partisan political positions. As you reflect back, you're my age, we're, we're, we're the same age, 56, soon to be 56. Mm -hmm. um, during those years that you reflect back and say, the one thing that I really remember the most, Greg, is this. And I know you've just mentioned your first argument in that case, and that may be it, but is there another event that really jumps out at, as a Seth Waxman highlight film? In terms of my professional life? Or personal, I mean. Oh, I don't know. You know, my first trial, my first, uh, the first person I represented, you know, on death row, who I thought had been, was innocent and wrongly convicted, where I, you know, got the court to issue a writ of habeas corpus and give him a new trial. Um, you know, I think about when I when I first went to work in the Justice Department. Um, not having been involved in partisan politics, not having, you know, been worked for the election of the president that I was, uh, whose administration I was serving, I, you know, I'd been in the, I'd been at work in the Justice Department for less than two weeks when, you know, I got a telephone call saying that the White House was, would like to hear about the Justice Department's reasoning and a position that it took uh, in a case, in an appeal that it had briefed that it had just filed in the Eighth Circuit. And I had come in to be an assistant, to sort of a policy assistant for Janet Reno, um, concerned about the civil side of the Justice Department, the civil division and the civil rights division and the environment division and the tax division and sort of immigration related things. And this was a uh, case involving religious, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and I'd never heard of this case. I didn't even know, I'd never been to the White House. I didn't really know what it meant to say that 
you you know go you're going over to explain to the white house counsel why why the justice department had taken a particular position and so i called bill bryson who's now a judge on the court of appeals for the federal circuit but was had been a career justice department lawyer and was the acting associate attorney general and said you know we got this request you know we're the associate attorney general we can we do this together and he said sure and you know we learned about this case and got in a car to ride over to the just to the white house before and i said to bill you know sort of explain me how this is going to go and he said i don't know i've never i've never been to meet with a white house counsel we went in and we started uh we went up to the white house counsel's office and i'm a brand new government lawyer i mean I, this is all totally new to me and we're sitting in the counsel's office in the west wing with the the counsel to the president and a few policy assistants explaining what the case is about when all of a sudden this big you know figure comes into the door frame the, the west wing is a very small intimate place and says you know what are you all talking about and it's the president of the united states mm -hmm. bill clinton is standing there and you know, the counsel of the president said well we know we're hearing about the position that the justice department has taken in this christians case which had to do with uh, a family that gave made a ten thousand dollar contribution to their church uh, literally on the way to file for bankruptcy mm -hmm. um, and the question the bankruptcy trustee it was a woman named julia christians had filed a paper in the bankruptcy court saying terrific that you made this ten thousand dollar contribution to your church but it's not your money if you're bankrupt you were giving your creditors money away and under the bankruptcy laws you need to give it back and the president who was a very strong believer in the free exercise clause was concerned about the justice department's defense of that position so the it was explained to the president and we were explaining the case and he said well i'm really interested in that and he sits down and he's in his socks and he puts his feet up on the coffee table and you know he says well, you know go ahead i want to hear about this so i'm stumbling my way through a explanation of a case that I myself only heard about three hours ago and the constitutional and statutory principles and he leans over and says well what about and then he starts rattling off um, First Amendment precedents of the Supreme Court he said well what about Epperson and how do you distinguish you know this from Justice Burton's opinion and such and so and I realizing that I am having possibly one of the most unique moments in my life first of all this guy i am the lawyer i'm the justice department person who's talking about this i'm being cross-examined by somebody who's citing cases yeah. to me which i remember that i read in law school but i couldn't actually tell you what they stand for and this person is the president of the united states wow. who sort of stumbled in and said what are you all talking about and um he sat there and we talked about the what the right position in this case was for about 15 or 20 minutes and then he left and you know we drove back to the justice department in the car and bill and i are looking at each other like is this what happens i mean this guy's the leader of the free world he just sort of walks in and we have this very intense high level debate about the contours and meaning of the first amendment and you know we're both shrugging our shoulders i can't remember coming home to dinner that night and saying you're gonna you have no idea what i did at work today i got cross-examined by the president of the united states for like 20 minutes about first amendment free exercise and establishment clause doctrines that's actually not the end of the story a couple months goes by nothing like that repeated itself and i never gave another moment's thought to this case when I get a telephone call um, from the White House saying that the president has been thinking about the case and has decided that the United States took the wrong position. I have no idea how one, what one is supposed to do when you get a phone call <laughs> like that. As far as I'm concerned, we filed the brief before I even joined the government. 
three months ago, I was invited to have a discussion about it. We did. For all I know, the case has already been argued and decided. Um, but the person who was calling, I think one of the assistant counsel to the president, said, you know, the president would, uh, w what, what's the status of this case? Because the president thinks we took the wrong position. We should take, we should withdraw our position. I said, oh, I don't know, I'll, I'll find out. And I called Bill Bryson to say, you're not going to believe this, but what is happening with this case? He said, I don't know. Turns out the case is going to be argued in Minneapolis the next morning. This is like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's scheduled. The lawyer for the Justice Department is a career lawyer named Lowell Sturgill, a young guy, is gone. And he is out there going to argue the case. He's going to argue the constitutional case and the statutory argument is being made by the lawyer for the bankruptcy trustee, Julia Christians. And we decide, well, we have to try and find him and tell him that the president wants the brief withdrawn. And so late that night, somebody from the Justice Department finds Lowell Sturgill in his hotel room and says, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but the president has decided that our position is wrong and you are not to present oral argument on this position and withdraw the brief. And his response is, what are you talking about? This is just that. You need to go to the court before argument begins and advise the court that, uh, that the United States is withdrawing its brief in the case. And um, that's what he did. And uh, <laughs> the, the panel insisted that Mr. Sturgill actually get up and articulate on the record that the United States was withdrawing the case, and they asked him on whose authority, and he said, this is on the authority and direction of the president himself. Um, so that was pretty memorable. Wow. That is. I'd hate to have been Lowell. You know, just think about the preparation. And, and this. No, what you would have hated to have been was the lawyer with whom he was sharing argument oh, yeah, yeah. because he had to get in the cab in the morning and say to this guy they had this arrangement that one was going to make the constitutional argument and one the statutory argument and you can imagine this other lawyer basically having Lowell say look I don't actually know how to break this to you but remember how we were going to divide up the argument well it turns out I'm not going to be making the argument at all and that half of the argument that you thought I was going to be doing you're going to be doing that's, that, you're right. That, that would be your worst nightmare. Uh, I've really taken up a lot of your time, Seth. This has been incredible. But I want one final question. Uh, uh, living in Connecticut, Red Sox or Yankees? Yankees. Okay. Why? And, and, and it's really hard to say because, you know, Hartford, Connecticut is almost equidistant mm -hmm. from Yan between Yankee Stadium and Fenway Park. And there were definitely people in my town that felt strongly both ways. I'd like to think that, you know, I made a very considered, thoughtful decision that had something other than, something to do with other than the fact that in the 1950s, in 1960s, the Yankees weren't just a baseball team. They were a force of nature. Mm -hmm. And it's honestly hard to see how somebody as impressionable as I was could have not rooted for Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, and Elston Howard, and Whitey Ford. I mean, it was just Tony Kubek. It was. They were just too awesome mm -hmm. not to root for. So I think I went with the winners. <laughs> Up camera, I'll tell you another story. This, is, this has been terrific because we are the same age, uh, almost, almost to the month. Uh, and I, did your mother throw out her, her, your baseball cards? Yes. Did yours? <laughs> yes. That's why they're valuable today. I had them, you know, in shoe boxes, and they were carefully organized, and they were they were thrown out not actually very long after I went to college. Yep. No, 
inevitably the spring cleaning that would have done them in. Yeah. yeah. Mom was moving them around, and that's a box they'll never see. And, and you come home four years later and say, wonder where they were. And, and tears now well right. up in our eyes. Long gone. Long, I had some incredibly valuable cards. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. You're very welcome. Welcome to Chautauqua. We look forward to the next couple days. Thanks. Likewise.